Our original land acknowledgement was presented on June 10th, 2018, and is beautifully written by the worship committee of that time, ably led by Phyllis Earhart. Today, we are presenting an amended version of our land acknowledgement that is also beautifully written, thanks to the gifts of Phyllis Earhart, working with the current worship committee. Because we believe that a land acknowledgement is a living document that changes over time. Monday, June 21st, tomorrow, is National Indigenous Day of Prayer. And as we have learned and grown in our understanding of what it means to live in right relations, that growth is reflected in a new version of the St. Andrew's Land Acknowledgement. It is our hope that this new version, like the original, will continue to spark conversation and deepen our understanding of what it means to walk in the path of reconciliation. So here is our new land acknowledgement. As we gather for worship at St. Andrew's United Church, we acknowledge that we are on land that has been the site of human activity for thousands of years. We recognize that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River, whose territory is covered by Treaty 13, known also as the Toronto Purchase. Toronto is still home to many Indigenous people, and we are neighbours. Our land acknowledgement is a step toward reconciliation, keeping us mindful of broken covenants and the need to make right with all our relations. Good morning. Good afternoon as you listen to this. And welcome to St. Andrew's United Church. Uh, my name is Tom Reynolds and I play usually in the trio and want to welcome you to today where the service is a bit different. It's a jazz service, but not in the way you might think of traditional jazz services that we've done here. Today we feature the improvisational, interactive and collaborative dimension of music creation, which is modeled by jazz in a rich way, but we're lucky to have an incredibly talented guest vocalist with us today, who some of you might remember from an evening workshop he did at St. Andrews in those days long ago, pre-pandemic days. <laughs> Hussein John Muhammad, I'd like to introduce, has joined us today, is a Toronto-based choral artist, composer and music facilitator and conductor who is passionate about excellence in the choral arts as a medium for cultural dialogue, building positive relations, and accessing the depth of the human spirit. Hussein works with all ages to bring interactive choral experiences in community education and business settings to inspire creative leadership and connection. Choral music has reconciled his diverse cultural heritage with living in Canada and helped transform the negativity of racism into something beautiful. He is currently pursuing doctoral studies in music education at the University of Toronto, and almost done, I think, focusing on the role of choral music and how it can play in supporting Muslim youth identity and dialogue with a diverse Canada. Hussein's music explores that dialogue between the sounds of Muslim devotion and music and, and also the sounds of the diverse Canadian music landscape. And we're going to be fortunate enough to hear some of this today. In the wake of the racist and Islamophobic terrorist attack on a Muslim family in London, Ontario, it is fitting that the power of this kind of music might offer spiritual resources for solidarity and transformation today, modeling and inspiring creative ways of reimagining and remaking Canada together as a better place for all peoples, cultures, and religions. Thank you, Hussein, for joining us today and sharing your gifts. For the, for the service today, too, we give special thanks to Dr. Mark Renke, music director at St. Andrews, a quartet of amazing vocalists who are behind, I wondered if they were there, are behind uh, me today. Um, George Kohler on bass and Lauren Nearing on drums, who you know, 
uh, Reverend Ruth Noble, who you saw, and James Brown, the interim here. A special thanks to Jen Danku Murai for her administrative support in making all this possible too. Reverend Neil Young is, is also uh, here today and a part of the service. Finally, at mindful of National Indigenous Peoples Day tomorrow and the day of prayer that Ruth talked about earlier, and a lingering sadness over the discovery of 215 unmarked graves at the former Kenloops Residential School, which underscores the long journey of reconciliation that remains ahead. It's an honor to welcome Jonathan Hamilton Daibo today as our guest speaker. Jonathan teaches a variety of courses at Emmanuel College and Victoria University, and I'm proud that he's a colleague of mine there. He focuses on the history and impacts of residential schools, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and the calls to action in the TRC. He also works with indigenous interactions with Christianity and the church and building community relationships. Aside from teaching, he seeks ways to enhance the presence of indigenous peoples, culture, and knowledge at the university as the special advisory on indigenous initiatives. He is the convener of the Indigenous Advisory Circle at Victoria University. The majority of Jonathan's early university career was in Indigenous Student Services. He was director of First Nations House there at U of T for a while, and was also the director of the Office of Indigenous Initiatives in the Provost Office at the university. We're lucky we got him from those big roles to come to Emmanuel, actually. Um, he's, uh, he's very active and teaches also at um, Martin Luther University at Wilfrid Laurier and as a guest speaker in many contexts. He actually studied uh, at Emmanuel College and got his Master of Theological Studies there. Phyllis and I remember those good days from, from his work there. Jonathan is Mohawk from Ganawagi, First Nations community outside Montreal. He is an unwaving Montreal Canadiens fan and he wanted me to make sure to announce that here today. Uh, and loves spending time with his family and kids. And in fact, today he pre-recorded the message so he could be with us because he had committed to camping with his family. So he's enjoying camping with his family, but is there with us in a pre-recorded pre message. So thank you, Jonathan. We're grateful to have you. So let's breathe uh, and prepare our hearts for joining together in worship, open to the Spirit's work. Accessing the depth of the human spirit, said Tom. In every tradition to worship, you'll find there are numbers of ways that is attempted and done during that worship. Mix the traditions together and how rich it can be. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, creator of the universe, to you be glory and praise forever and ever. God, the eternal, whose presence fills creation, who has given us life and brought us to this day, as near as our soft breathing in the night, as remote from us as the stars. Lord of beginnings, remover of obstacles, the most gracious, the most merciful. Show us the straight path. The true word is our guide and the light of love. No reading of books gives this and no sermons. No matter what we do, peace is a mystery to us. But the one who remembers your name will find it all. O oh God, hear our prayer.
in a week of vaccine lineups and vaccine hoping, of some people doing something and some waiting a little longer, a week of places in the world that have waited for generations, a week of still being your church apart. We offer our prayers and listen for the hopefulness that we can find in music and prayer shared even at this distance. Lift up our hearts, we pray. O oh God, hear our prayers. When we are done here, let us all remember that we have our own portion of talents and places in tradition, and that we can lift up hearts as our hearts have been lifted today. Of all things along the way ahead, let us be useful to each other and good for each other, finding our way, since none of us really know what is the straight path. So why should worship and music and prayer not be as effective as anything and more than many things in these COVID times and through these COVID times? Only that you will go with us and your true word and light of love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good morning to everyone. Thank you so much for opening your hearts and allowing me to share this space with you today. Um, it's a beautiful thing that we can come together and recognize the gift of submission to greater ideals of healing and harmony, coming together in peace, in wholeness, and mending the divisions and bridges that divide us. I am um, very honored to be able to, uh, to recite today, to put forward a devotional poem from the South Asian Ismaili Muslim community. And this poem is one that I have always loved, which asks the question of how do we authentically and beautifully submit to God and to those ideals and values of kindness and care and curiosity and knowledge seeking so we can make the world a better place. That poem says, the true guide arrives at our steps. How do we submit and bow with reverence? The poem talks about a pious woman who breaks her pearl necklace and all the pearls are scattered on the courtyard. And when she picks them up, it takes her a long time. And this is a way that she shows her piety. The rest of the poem 
asks us to deeply go into the storm, into the waves of the ocean, and draw the wisdom that we need that can help us live more fulfilled and better lives. And lastly, there's a line that I love that says, our love for God is like a print on a sari cloth. The cloth can tear, but the print will always remain. Satagura avya kai aparne dwar.
reading from Proverbs. Trust in God with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge God and God will make your paths smooth. Our next offering is a beautiful coming together of the threads of the silk of our lives, written by a former singer in the Vancouver Ismaili Muslim Youth Choir, Menaz Tower. This was inspired by another such uh, offering by Sophia Song Healer, a contemplation chant which brought w texts and melodies from different traditions together into one. This piece is called Traveler's Meditation, and it holds together Allahu Akbar from the Muslim tradition, God is great. Kyrie eleison from the Christian tradition, Lord have mercy. Om Shanti Om from the Hindu tradition and Sanskrit traditions. Om Tranquility, Peace, Om and Shalom Haverim, Shalom Haverim from the Jewish tradition. We shall see you again, my friends, Shalom. Together, the choir here and our, our band and Mark, we're going to create a texture of what I think is a dream for a possibility for what our futures could look like.
The gospel reading today is taken from Mark. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boats. The boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern asleep on the cushion and they woke him up and said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Sego, my name is Jonathan Hamilton Dybo, and I am very honored this morning to be joining the community of St. Andrew's United Church um, to provide the message, although by recording today instead of in person, um, but I am so thankful for the invitation. As stated in Canada's Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs website, June 21st is National Indigenous Peoples Day. This is a day for all Canadians to recognize and celebrate the unique heritages, diverse cultures, and outstanding contributions of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. At a time where the focus should be on celebrating, we are starkly reminded of the unspoken history between Indigenous peoples and Canada. We look at the impacts of legislation that govern Indigenous peoples, as found in the Indian Act. We see the development of an educational system supported by government and church to civilize Indigenous peoples, through the, as we've known through the residential school system. And furthermore, in the news recently, CTV headline on May 28, 2021, remains of 215 children found buried at a formal residential school, First Nation says. This is followed by a disclaimer contains details some readers may find distressing. CNN, June 1st, 2021. Unthinkable discovery in Canada as remains of 215 children found buried near residential school. As well, there's other investigations and many calls for the government to provide the resources to support the other searches in other places. This recent news has greatly impacted many in First Nations communities, Canada, and around the world. From this, there's been many feelings that have come out of this. Anger, sadness, grief, disbelief. Many are left asking these following questions. Why or how could this happen? As we've also seen with these feelings have been reactions. We have been reading about the incidents over at Ryerson University in which people have gathered to demonstrate and to pull down the statue of Ryerson. In Ganawage, a Mohawk community for where I'm from, the Roman Catholic Church um, was spray painted orange. The, door, the front doors are spray painted orange. And also there was a symbolic protest of 215 shoes late in front of the church. And then more recently, there was a possible link of arson of the Anglican church in Six Nations. And so we think about all these actions that are, are taking place and, and, and how our feelings are resulting in these type of activities um, to try to rectify or think about a situation. And I think this has left many feeling unsure, as I mentioned, disbelief. And so I like to refer back to Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, and I'm using the NIV. Ver the NIV. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understandings. In your own ways, submit to him, and he will make your path right. I think these are wise words at a time 
because with feelings, people are looking at ways to either lash out or try to rectify a situation that they just don't have any comprehension on. And sometimes this comprehension is, is again, going back to that key question. How could that happen? How could this happen? And I think it's something that we really need to think about um, as, we, as, we, as we try to comprehend this horrific event and these discoveries. We do need to acknowledge, though, that in, in many communities, maybe communities in your own or as individuals, that you have undertaken different activities to try to repair these relationships. But after seeing what's going on and hearing, the, the next question might be, what's next? Where do we go? And I want to bring us now a little to history. These issues of the residential school were brought forward um, in 1996 uh, in an inquiry known as the Royal Commissions of Aboriginal People. Now, in this was a larger uh, inquiry regarding what was going on with Indigenous peoples in Canada at the time. And in one of the issues that were being dealt with or spoken about was residential schools. It wasn't the full focus of that inquiry, but it was brought forward in there. And that was in 1996. What happened was that largely this report was ignored. Within the Indigenous community, it still remains very valuable and is something that many people look forward to. But largely, people may have heard of RCAP, they may have an understanding of it, of, or at least they acknowledge it's there, but really didn't fully comprehend what that inquiry was saying. And then we fast forward to 2015 and the release of the Truth and Reconciliation Final Report and Call to Action. And what is interesting about that in 2015 was the reactions at that time, the reactions from many people who were listening and hearing about these stories for the first time about residential schools and those survivors and what they encountered in the schooling system. And so for many, it was a time of shock and dismay. However, for many Indigenous people, this was always a reality. This was always there. Now we move ahead six years in the year 2021. And I just read those, uh, those, those headlines talking about the children in Kamloops. And what's interesting is that many of the reactions right across Canada are the same. Shock, asking people asking, how could this happen? I don't understand this. It is horrifying. The thing that I find really interesting in all this was that the TRC did acknowledge this. The TRC itself had an entire chapter on the, the missing and unmarked burials. So if that was already put out there, the main question is, why are so many people shocked as if they're hearing about this for the first time? In the summary of the TRC, um, which, which was put out before the main report, but it was stated in there on page 8, too many Canadians know little or nothing about the deep historical roots of these conflicts. This lack of historical knowledge has serious consequences for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. And for Canada as a whole, it concludes by saying, history plays an important role in reconciliation. So when we talk about history, we have made some assumptions in the last six years at least, that the awareness of these issues have been brought forward. They've been in the media. They're, they're integrated into schooling now when we see things such as uh, and in churches, when we see land acknowledgements being used. However, what still I find shocking is that people are really shocked, as if this is the first time they've heard it. From my end, yes, I've had sadness. Yes, I've had some anger. However, there's a degree of maybe resignation. 
And that, again, is because this is something that many communities have been aware of. And so this isn't news. It is stunning when you still hear the number and you still think of the impacts. But what we have to think about is that how truly do we know our history? Do we understand these, these events that happened and how they impacted people? Because if we don't, if we do not understand that history, if we, not tr- we may know about it, but if we don't truly understand the impacts, then what will happen is that each time we will have these shocks occur again and again. And what I mean by that is that over time, this issue will fade. When we look in the news, it is still in there, but it still doesn't have the spotlight that it once did because something new has come up. And now people are focusing on that. So what will happen over time is that this will fade away in the background and then will resurface greatly once new discoveries or something comes in that's related to residential schools. And again, people will be shocked one more time. So how do we move ahead with reconciliation if we're always in a stage of shock? If we're always in a stage of we're always distressed because of it? Where does the reflection come in? Where does it come to a place where we are still disturbed by these discoveries? But we have enough knowledge now to make reflections, to think it through, and to really dive deep into what these issues are. And so this is something that we really need to think about when we talk about understanding history, understanding these relationships. And it goes back to what was said in that summary. History plays an important role in reconciliation. And a big reason for that is if we don't have an understanding, we will not have, we will not be able to achieve reconciliation. So what does this all mean? So let's look at Mark 4, the passage that we was read earlier, which talked about when Jesus and disciples were on a boat and as they were crossing, a ferocious squall came up. The waves broke over the boat and they were, they were terrified. They thought they were going to be swamped. They didn't, they didn't know what was going to happen while Jesus was you know, sleeping on a cushion. Uh, the disciples will come up and they're, they're, they're frantic. They're, they're saying, teacher, don't you care if we drown? And he gets up and he rebukes the wind and the waves. Quiet and be still. Then he goes on to say to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Don't you have no faith? And that is really interesting because I think this is something that we really need to think about in all of this in all our relations, because sometimes there's a lot of pain. And the things we've been reading about have been very hurtful and distressing to many. But despite all this, we need to trust God. Whatever storm we're encountering this time, personal storms, storms that are affecting our communities, that are affecting our country, affecting each other, We need to trust God. We have to hope that this discovery actually may ease the suffering of communities who've always been wondering about those missing. And that it may bring a degree of relief, although it's still hurtful, but it may bring relief that these children have been found and it may make a difference to a community or some members of that community. We have to put in hope that there is progress happening. So at times it may feel like things are falling apart and we're never going to move ahead. Things are happening. We see an awareness of history and how it is told that is growing. More people are becoming more aware. An example is at Victoria University last week. It was announced that they've renamed, after a lot of consultation with community members, Indigenous people, uh, that they were renaming 
the residence that was named after Ryerson. There's also been other initiatives happening across the country in which uh, are to address some of the things that have been lost for people going to residential school. And one of the things is the ability to speak languages, indigenous languages. And so we're starting to see it, language revitalization happening in the high schools. There are languages that are being offered in university and within community as well. And people are given the opportunity to relearn what was lost. It may be difficult, though, to comprehend what has happened. And not just with this event about the found children, but also with today's communities and the things that they face. Substance abuse issues within their community, violence, racism, suicide, poverty. There are a lot of things that are still happening, but we still have to trust that this storm will be calmed. And by the calming of the storm, that a path will be provided for us to move ahead. We have found this word trust in so many different places in scripture. And I'm only going to name a few here. In Jeremiah 17, verses 7 to 8. Be blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Isaiah 26, verse 3. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust you. Psalm 28, 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him. There is an opportunity to learn about these narratives that have been suppressed for so long. Those stories, good and bad, must be told. This is the cause for celebration. But to do this, we need to be patient. We have to be keep our hearts and minds open and to understand that this will take time. This is not a short process. This is a long-term commitment. And so we need to remember that. And in closing, I do want to provide a quote that Elf, Reverend Elf Dumont um, wrote, in, and Elf is a son of alumni of Emmanuel College. Um, and he's written, uh, his newer book is called The Other Side of the River, From Church Pew to Sweat Lodge. And it is talking about his story. But he does open this up in his preface. And this is actually the words he he is actually himself remembering um, that was given to him by an elder. My way of looking at life is not your way of looking at life. The way I talk about life is not the way you talk about life. We must honor each other's way of looking at the world. We must honor each other's way of talking about the world. We do have to accept that there are going to be things that happen that are going to upset our own realities and how we think and perceive the world around us and that these new narratives are going to shake it. But if we keep an open mind and that we respect one another, we will find some commonalities and we will be able to move ahead. Yawagoa. Thank you.
Let us pray. Loving God, you call us to come to worship, knowing that we come with all our failings and weaknesses, ready to share all our struggles and joys with you. You call us together on a path of acceptance, understanding, and love. All are welcome in your love. God, we live in a hurting world a world of prejudice and oppression. We have witnessed racism within the Islamic community, prejudice and judgment among the LGBTQ plus community. We've grieved with families at the indigenous graves that were found, knowing that there are thousands more. We lift all those who struggle with violence and oppression on a daily basis and offer our prayers of love and support. 
Many within our community live lives of illness and anxiety. For those we name in our hearts, we offer our prayers of care and compassion. We give you thanks, O oh God, that you accept and love us as we are. May we be encouraged by your spirit to hold those who need to be held. May we rejoice with those who are rejoicing and weep with those who are weeping. May we offer our all to you, together and apart, united in one body of Christ. Amen. And our closing hymn is in Star and Crescent, More Voices 159. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you, and may God grant you peace. Go now and be God's light in the world. Amen. Amen.